Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. When you're young and you've got nearly nothing, how do you go from there to accumulating more than 1,900 rental doors in just 48 months? You begin by acting, even buying your first property with a credit card, then leveraging your network through email and social media. It's just part of the real estate story with today's remarkable guest on Get Rich Education. MC Lobsher is the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast and president of Producers Wealth. He is on a mission to help you achieve financial independence and freedom as soon as possible. He achieves this by integrating the infinite banking concept with real estate investments to increase your returns and recapture cash flow that you are not even aware of that you're losing. MC shares the number one strategy of investors in his holistic wealth creation course at yourownbankingsystem.com. Learn the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those investment properties. Narada Real Estate saves you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more at PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com and download your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing. There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Bayonne, France to Bayonne, New Jersey and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education, and I'm so grateful that you're here, but you're not here for me. You're here for you. Let's talk about something that I don't talk about very often, and that is your age. Look, if you're interested in investing and you're under 30 years old, you haven't been smacked in the face before because you haven't experienced an economic recession yet. You've never been punched in the jaw. If you're a boxer and it's round four out of 12 and you still haven't been punched at all yet, it's pretty easy for you to confidently dance around the ring in your boxing trunks and taunt your opponent and totally feel like you aren't going to get taken down. You feel invincible. I've talked to you before about how I weathered the real estate downturn of 2007 to 2009. The short story is then I bought for cash flow, not appreciation. All of my properties were cash flowing then, and they are now as well. Now, I don't mention people's age very often on this show, maybe only unless someone has achieved an extraordinary amount of accomplishment in a short period of time. So we're going to discuss that a bit today because that's the case. And why else don't I mention age very often? I just don't like to label people. If the first thing you know about a guy is that he's 78 Now, maybe you don't think he even has an Instagram account, and it's easy to have a lot of other preconceived notions about a person. Maybe you won't think he's your marketing guy. Same thing if you hear that someone is 21. If you know that early on about a person, you might discount what knowledge they might have. It gets easy to pigeonhole people once they have that label. Come on, we all do it to some extent. It's sort of like when you find out what someone's political party affiliation is. Oh, gosh, I would rather not know, because as conscious as we try to be not to do so, now that we know their political party, it's so easy to extrapolate out what they think about abortion or the military or even climate change. I mean, how did that one ever get politicized anyway? But In any case, if we don't use those labels at all, it can often help people think more independently. You can think more in terms of principles. Maybe this is just one reason that dogs are so popular. You know, they don't belong to any political party. Well, we will talk about the age of today's guest with his $150 million real estate portfolio because he has achieved a lot. At a fairly young age, he is good at finding deals. He's good at raising money, coaching, personal development, and mindset. Now, if you don't have the, oh, between $18,000 and $40,000 yourself to buy your own income property 
at greturnkey.com yet, you'll also relate to today's guest because he knows how to be scrappy. And being young, he's not so far removed from when he had to be scrappy to get where he is today. So he's relatable. He's a highly relatable guy. And that's a big reason why I wanted him to be here today. And today, he invests heavily in the apartment building space. Well, that's an increasingly tricky area to navigate. It has been for years, and it's only getting harder. So I will pointedly ask him about apartments falling cap rates today, and that a lot of apartment deals are worse now than they were 10 or 5 or even 3 years ago. For those new listeners that are uninitiated, remember commercial real estate is actually slang for residential apartment buildings of five or more units. That's our context today. Today's guest is based in Cleveland, Ohio, but you'll see how he also has substantial experience outside of his home market. Let's meet today's guest. Meet the founder and CEO of CommercialEmpire.com and CLE, Turnkey Real Estate. He acquires and transforms distressed apartment buildings into high-yield assets. He has built a passive real estate business and created residual income that allows him to live the lifestyle of his choice. He's here to help others gain financial freedom, predominantly through apartment real estate. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Tim Bratz. Keith, appreciate you having me, buddy. Thanks for all the content and the value that you provide here, and I'm excited to be on the show. Tim, you're interesting to me. I think when someone's around you, they just feel this aura and believability, and they feel like you're a person that can lead them. That's a feeling that I get when I'm around you. And you've done some really interesting things, even though you're only 33 years old. For example, you raised $4 million over a weekend. But let's go back to how you got started first. You got started in real estate in an atypical way. 10 years ago, you were just 23 years old, and you bought your first house in a most interesting way. Tell us about that. (laughs) <laughs> I was going through college when the market was going gangbusters, right? 03 to 07. People said, if you wanted to make money, get involved in real estate. And yeah. My brother was living in New York at the time, New York City. And I moved out there, became a real estate agent for commercial real estate. So I'd broker leases and transactions. And I remember brokering 400 square foot space in Manhattan and it went for $10,000 a month. <laughs> 400 square feet. That's 20 by 20. Square feet. annual escalations and a 12 year lease term. And so I remember doing the math and seeing this landlord and thinking this guy's going to make almost $2 million over the next 12 years for doing something at one point in time. And I realized I was on the wrong side of the coin. Instead of doing the transactional and brokering, I needed to be owning real estate and get that residual income, that passive income. That's what pivoted me into becoming an investor. I moved down to Charleston, South Carolina. And I think what happens is a lot of us get involved in real estate because of that mailbox money and the idea of residual income and doing something once and getting paid on it over and over again. And for sure, passive and having that income come in. And then a lot of us fall back into that transactional piece, which is what happened to me of going and thinking I had to stockpile my own money in order to be able to buy those passive income producing assets. And so I got back into real estate down in Charleston, South Carolina, just on a whim, moved there for better weather and uh, found, this is an 09 now, so just about 10 years ago, bought the cheapest house on the entire MLS. So I'm 23 years old at the time. I find the cheapest house. It's listed for 25 grand. The only problem was I didn't have $25,000. So I asked myself a question, how do you get $25,000 when you're 23 years old? Nobody knows you or you know, you're a punk kid and uh, nobody's going to lend you money. You've never done a real estate deal. So how do you do this? Yeah. And uh, I remember reading someplace that you could increase your credit card limit if you just called up your credit card company and asked them for an increase. And so that's what I did. I called up my credit card company, asked them to increase my limit from $3,000 up to $100,000. And uh, they laughed at me. <laughs> they said, absolutely not. You had this thing open for about eight months. There's no way we're going to give you that kind of a limit. And so I said, well, how much can you give me right now? And they said, 15 grand, one five. And I said, okay, go ahead and do that. Now I had $15,000 to work with. I called up the list agent and made an offer on the property at 12 grand. We went back and forth and I got it, ended up getting it for $14,000. Hey, that's awesome. When you lack resources, find resourcefulness. That's it, man. hundred percent. That's my number one keyword or motto is, is being resourceful. You know, a lot of people say they can't get involved in real estate because they don't have the time. They don't have the money. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the resources, but resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. If you are resourceful, you can go out and find the answer. And I think that's 
one of the things that I've been able to duplicate and convey in, in my real estate business and has really helped me have the success that I've had. Now, a lot of times when you go and intentionally look for the cheapest property, it doesn't tend to work out. But did that first property in Charleston, South Carolina work out for you? <laughs> you get kicked in the teeth once in a while and that definitely happened. I don't know what I was doing and I'm trying to figure out how to do the landscaping, how to do the painting, how to change <laughs> out carpet. I'm searching YouTube videos on how to do all this stuff and I don't know how to sell it. So I knocked on the neighbor's doors and just because I had the resourcefulness and the grit to go out and make that happen, one of the neighbors came in and ended up paying me $33,000 for a house that I was all into for about nineteen grand. So after closing costs and everything, I probably made twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 on it. And um, I was hooked. Went out, did it again, did it again, got involved in wholesaling real estate, got involved pretty heavily in uh, flipping houses, like the retail type stuff that you see on HGTV. I was doing about 100 turnkey single family houses a year and uh, was real successful in that. But again, it wasn't building my wealth. You know, I was just putting food on the table and keeping the lights on and uh, maybe had some money, had a good lifestyle, but I didn't, wasn't really building well. So I started raising money for some apartment deals and also uh, building up a little bit of an apartment portfolio myself. And about a little over 18 months ago, I looked at my life and I was reflecting on where I was and realized that 90% of my wealth was built with apartments and it was only 10% of my time. And so I ended up just pivoting my entire turnkey business and rolled into apartments. It's been good. I'm at a little over 2,000 units today and $150 million portfolio. And some of those I own 25% of the apartment building. Some of my own 100% of the apartment building. But I have a significant amount of equity in 2,000 units across five different states. And we got another 1,000 units under contract right now. So we're moving in a good direction. Yeah, that's an astounding portfolio at only age 33. Started with resourcefulness, and I'm sure that resourcefulness mantra has gotten you far as you've been in so many things, wholesaling, flipping, buy and holds, and from single family homes up to apartments. So tell us about your typical deal flow these days. I think of you as a very active investor and as a deal flow guy. Tell us about some of that. I uh, just kind of built a reputation of buying apartment buildings. Everybody that knew me from the local real estate investors associations and anybody I networked with and the different mastermind groups that I was in knew that I bought apartment buildings. And that really wasn't like the cool thing to do until the past years. Anybody who came across an apartment building, what I realized is I come from the residential realm, but there's a lot of people in the residential realm who don't know how to underwrite a commercial deal and how to figure out if it's a good value or not. And so they usually just discard those leads. And for me, I just reached out to my list and I think you get our emails too, Keith. Yeah. You get our emails every week that say, hey, we're looking to buy apartment buildings. We're sitting on some cash. We're looking to deploy it. And we're just staying top of mind. I think that's one of the most important things that people can do in real estate or in any business is letting people know what you do. If you're not going to promote yourself, why would anybody else promote you? And so letting people know what we do, not in a sleazy way, not in a, in a self promotion of like just being self-absorbed way, but trying to give value. Gary Vaynerchuk had just released a book. It's called Jab, Jab, Right Hook. And right. Um, it's all about giving value, giving value, giving value, doing things like you're doing right now on this podcast is providing value to other people. And what happens is you provide so much value that when there is an ask that occurs, people are like, oh my God, I, like I owe this guy something. And so let me see if I can help out or send some emails to my list or help He's staying top of mind in my world. And anytime I've come across a deal, I'm going to send it over to him. Gary Vee wanted to name that book, jab, 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 right hook. And they told him no, because obviously the wouldn't fit on the cover, but that's how much he believes in give, 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 ask. And so that's what I've done both on social media and through my general network of investors, my database of people who... I've done business with or have ever inquired on projects. We keep a database of everybody who's ever contacted us. And it's a simple Excel spreadsheet. We got their name, number, their email address, and some notes on what they're looking for. And we just drip emails on a regular basis, giving value, giving content. How do we find deals? How do we raise money? How do we secure financing? How do we oversee project management, value add process? How do we stabilize these properties? How do we screen our tenants? Not only real estate, but we also give a lot of wealth building content and just personal development type stuff too. And, and uh, my goal is not to have a million people in my database that are getting my emails that are lukewarm. My goal is to have thousand people who are fire white hot 
about following what we're doing and how we do it and always communicating those opportunities that they come across then with us. If there's anything that I think we've done really well, it's just giving a lot of value. And it's amazing how that just comes full circle and um, how many people have then sent deals to us. We actually don't spend any money on advertising. I mean, other than like our email server type of thing, that's 30 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month. I don't even know what it is. And, um, but like other than that, we just drip emails, giving value, giving value, giving value. We hold mastermind events where people come out and we educate just on, on business development. It doesn't even have to be real estate entrepreneurs. It's just general entrepreneurs and any type of business because we're all facing those same struggles in business. It's all finance, it's all accounting, it's all marketing, it's all sales, it's all human resources, all that kind of stuff. And so we put groups together like that. We're pretty active on both social media and then locally as well. And we get a lot of deal flow from it. We get a lot of money flow from it as well. Yeah, you're really influential on social media. And when you send someone just say weekly emails, well, whenever that someone runs into money and they want to invest that money in a deal, you are going to be one of the first people they think of because you recur in their lives, even if it's just in an email form and you're providing value that way. So that's part of finding the money for the deal. But today, a lot of investors would tell you that their top problem is finding the deal over there on the deal side and not so much the money. So tell us about how you find your deals, especially these apartment building deals that you're so active in with syndicating today. A great question. And what you need to realize is that real estate investors, people who are buying real estate for rental income, they are at all times, especially people who own apartment buildings or people who buy single family houses for rental purposes, they fall into three categories. They can be a buyer of your properties. They can be a seller of properties to you. And they can be an investor, meaning a lender of private capital to you. It just depends on timing. So where are they in their career? Where are they? Are they deal heavy? Are they money heavy? Very rarely are we both, right? So it just depends on where they're at. Like me right now, I'm a net buyer of real estate, but I'm still selling some properties. Yeah. There's, there's some of my smaller apartment buildings that I'm selling, maybe a couple things in more like a C-class area as I'm trying to just stick to A and B-class kind of areas now. So I'm still selling some of the smaller stuff in my portfolio in order to focus on some bigger things from a management perspective. It makes sense. If you can build up a list of those property owners and then just continually drip value to them and talk to them about, are they buying? Are they selling? Are they lending money? Do they want to partner up? Do they want a joint venture? And hit them from each different angle. You don't need to build multiple lists. You need to build one list and you can reach out to those people about multiple different topics. And when the timing's right, just like you mentioned, Keith, you're going to find somebody who's looking to sell. Or you're going to find somebody who's looking to buy a property from you. Or you're going to find somebody who just sold a bunch of their property. They don't want to buy any more but they understand residual income. They understand passive income. And they like the idea of having a fixed return on their investment and just lending you the money at 8%, 10%, 12%, whatever that looks like. We use the exact same list that we raise money from to actually buy properties from as well. Especially like right now when the market gets tighter and tighter and hotter and hotter, you got to be willing to do the things that other people are not willing to do. So a couple of years ago, you could buy anything you wanted on the MLS. Then it turned into like direct mail for the past few years. Now it's turning into a couple other different types of scenarios, ringless voicemails and text message campaigns and all that kind of stuff. Are there that many people actually going out and knocking on doors? There's not that many people who are willing to do that. There's not that many people who are going and talking to the neighbors of a distressed property that has tall grass and boarded up windows. And if you're willing to go out and do some of those, there's a lot of deals out there still. You just got to be willing to do the work that other people aren't willing to do, and you'll get the deals that other people can't find. I love this. I'm finding a real philosophy in what you're telling me. Whether your method of reaching people is old-fashioned knocking on doors or more current ringless voicemails or direct mail campaigns, what you're doing is rather than having a separate list for buyers and a separate list for sellers and a separate list for investors, they're all in one list. And kind of what you're doing is telling people, hey, come alongside me and partner alongside with me rather than sitting across the table from me. Exactly. It's an abundance mentality versus yeah. a scarcity mentality. It's how can we do business together? How can we make money together? How can we build wealth together? Me versus you. No, it's not that. It's let's do this together. How can we create a win-win? 
That is some great advice for finding deals because the MLS and LoopNet really isn't the place to find the best deals these days. Especially for commercial real estate, it's a different set of rules and guidelines that commercial real estate agents and commercial real estate investors have to abide by. And so usually those listings don't need to go on the MLS or on LoopNet immediately. They can kind of be shopped around for a month or two to the top buyers in town. And so if you see something that does hit the market, it's because the top buyers in town all said no to that project, at least in commercial real estate. Could be a different story in, in residential, but we try to find direct to seller off market projects, just like a lot of times we did in, in the residential realm. And how do we do that? It's hitting them from a couple different angles. You don't need to do a, a thousand different types of marketing campaigns. I'd figure out a handful, maybe three, four of them that work really well for you that give you the highest return on your dollars and return on your time and double down on those. And um, that's all we do. Yeah, I really think it is about getting out there, being enterprising and trying a whole bunch of different techniques, even admitting you might fail on most of them. And that's really going to help isolate what works best for you in reaching people, finding both the deals and the money. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Tim Bratz. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Finally, Total Control Financial gives you checkbook control of your 401k and IRA money to invest in real estate. It's time to get your retirement money into your own checking account, but you've got to avoid the little-known tax that you'll pay with any self-directed IRA. Instead, it's time for the QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. For a real estate investor like you seeking an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. Over the years, you've heard President Chaley Ridge generously devote her time to you here on the show as a guest. Ridge provides investment property loans in most U.S. states, and you're going to find out how they've helped more people realize their dreams of real estate financial freedom than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is author Kristen Tate. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Tim Bratz of CommercialEmpire.com. He's accumulated more than 1,900 multifamily units in just 48 months. Tim, talk to us some more about raising money and finding real estate deals. I think what a lot of people don't realize is it's easy to raise money right now, especially if you have the right deal. You know, everybody wants to deploy capital into fixed assets. They don't like the volatility of the marketplace and in, in the stock markets at least. And they want to put money into something that's tangible. You can see, touch it, feel it. And so it's pretty easy to actually raise money right now for real estate investments. It was a different story five, six years ago. Five, six years ago, real easy to find deals, really hard to find money. Today, real easy to find money, really hard to find deals. So I think the two most important things that you can do in a real estate business, two most important things that the CEO should not let go of is finding deals and finding money. Those are the two revenue generating activities that you cannot get away from. And so right now, it's hard to find deals and it's easy to find money, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't continuously always be raising money because what's going to happen in the course of the next couple of years here is the market will shift uncertainty will come in, speculation will come in, and prices will drop, interest rates will increase. And from that, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to buy. And if you didn't dig your well before you were thirsty on the raising money side, that's definitely a piece that you're going to want to have dialed in. So now's the time to start having those conversations. What I would do is I'd start doing some small deals. Do a $20,000 loan, do a $50,000 loan, do a $100,000 loan, and then educate your investors. Pay them back in full, pay them back early, you know, maybe give them a little bit of a bonus on their money, do some small deals, build that relationship, and then also educate them that, hey, the market is going to turn. Hey, things are going to shift. Hey, the interest rates will increase. We're going to be in a, in a buying situation. We're going to buy some stuff at deep, deep discounts, pennies on the dollar over the course of the next few years here. So uh, get liquid. Let's prepare for that. So that way, when they read the headlines in the next couple of years, when they see that everybody's running away from real estate, you are the genius who predicted this. And it's not prediction, it's cycles, it's market cycles. This has been happening since the dawn of civilization, right? Yeah. Of uh, things peak and then they trough and then they peak and then they trough. 
you go through that whole cycle and you're just letting people know that you are an unemotional investor. You're reading the market cycles. You understand that we're at the top right now, but financing still good. So it still makes sense if you can buy at a wholesale price to pick up properties right now. And then you're planting those seeds that when the market does shift, you want them as a partner in that regard. And you guys can build a lot of wealth together long-term. So I'd always be planting those seeds, even though money's easy to find right now, I'd continually develop those relationships and develop those conversations with anybody who, who may have interest in doing that. And before the break, you said something pretty interesting. We talk about market cycles here. You said that apartments haven't really been the cool thing to do until the last year. Tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of a timing thing. And, and there's a lot of people who've had a lot of success over the past three, four, five, six years of investing. And they went through the trough cycle and, and they were buying houses for cheap. And they've kind of developed an acumen for investing in single family residential real estate. And then there's this conversation of, is this it? You know, what's next kind of a thing? What's bigger? And naturally, the progression from residential real estate is going to be residential commercial real estate. So apartment buildings, specifically multifamily, and then maybe progress into retail or office or warehouse or storage or anything like that. So people who have been successful in real estate for the past several years, as the market's been going gangbusters since 16, 17, 18, now 19, they're doing the transactional thing. They're making money. They're making great money, but now they're trying to build some wealth. And so over the past year or two, really there's been a lot of attention on apartment buildings. And I guess I just kind of fell into that curve a little bit before other people did. And I ended up uh, having a few hundred units under my belt by then. And I was seen kind of as bigger than the small guys, but not quite a real estate trust or a hedge fund. And so I've had a lot of people reach out to me about education stuff. So I, I do some training and coaching and, and mentoring in the apartment space. And I get a lot of good deal flow from that too. So that's something where I'm able to partner up with people where maybe they don't have the balance sheet, they don't have the net worth or the liquidity or the experience in owning apartment buildings, but they're sharp investors. They know how to deal with contractors. They know how to manage property. They know how to work with the utility companies and different building departments. And so I'm able to then partner up with people across the country who can find deals, who can run the project management, and who can be our boots on the ground. I can bring the money to those transactions. I can bring the financing to those transactions. I can bring some of the back office management and mentorship to those transactions. And it's a way that we can create a win-win. You know, I think a lot of people, they want to keep 100% of the deal for themselves, but 100% of a grape only has a little bit of juice in the squeeze. You take a look at a watermelon, and even if you had 25% of a watermelon, there's a lot more juice in the squeeze of 25% of a watermelon. So the other thing that I would share is expand your thinking, expand your mindset that you don't have to own 100% of everything. You can own 25% of it and make a significant impact, and a significant dent in your net worth and increase it pretty dramatically over the course of a very short period of time and probably have more fun doing it because you're, now you're only focused on your unique ability. What are you great at and your strengths? And you can complement your weaknesses with somebody else who, who that's their strength. And that way you're having more fun, you're doing more deals, you're more diversified and you're across more markets. So it's been a really cool way that we've been able to develop and build these partnerships and, and work with some really awesome people across the country. When it comes to finding partnerships and investors, do you think they get more caught up in the momentum of apartment building investing and all? You know, when we talk about market cycles, we have the obvious headwind of cap rates going down. Since cap rate is income divided by price, and now one needs to often pay a higher price for an apartment building for about the same level of income, that's a headwind against profitability. And then, of course, oftentimes with apartment buildings, you can't tie up your fixed debt for 30 years. So you potentially have this specter of having to refinance for higher interest rates in five, seven, or maybe even 10 years. So how do you cope with that part of the market cycle in apartment buildings? Yeah, I'm a real estate investor. That means I don't pay. There's some real estate investors that do pay retail price. I don't pay retail price for anything. And so I see a lot of people going in and buying at a 6% cap rate. And that's just boggles my mind because as interest rates increase, guess what else increases? Cap rates. And if you have to refinance in five years from now, if you have to sell in five years from now and you're buying at a six cap and then interest rates go up to 7% yeah. over the next five years, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to pay down enough principal. 
And the property is not going to appreciate at all. It's actually going to depreciate because cap rates increase. It works inversely with values and you're going to be underwater. So I think there's going to be a boatload of apartment buildings that come on the market in the next five years from everybody who's buying them right now at retail prices at a six cap. And I see people projecting 5% annual escalations in rents and interest rates staying exactly the same. If a perfect economy and a perfect world and a perfect interest rate works out, then they'll, they'll make a couple of bucks in five years from now. Yeah, we both know that's so unlikely. Smoked. Yeah, they're going to get smoked and they're going to lose their tail in the next five years. And so I think that's going to be a big opportunity for people who are disciplined investors, disciplined buyers over the next three, four, five years here. But me, I don't invest that way. First of all, I only buy things that are pretty distressed. I buy the stuff that most hedge funds and real estate trusts won't buy because I'm willing to do a little bit more work than what they're willing to do. So I do a little bit heavier of a lift, meaning it's more distressed physically and from a management perspective than other people are, are looking at. So I'll buy stuff that's 60, 70, 80% occupied. And then I'll go and put in the sweat equity to force appreciation. I don't speculate on appreciation. I force appreciation based on the work that we do to these buildings. And when you're able to go in and increase income, increase the rents, decrease the expenses, and you increase the net operating income, that increases the value of the building. Apartment buildings are exclusively valued based on the income approach. What's the net income of the property? They don't care about what the building down the street sold for. They care about what is the NOI on that property. And so for me, we force the appreciation. We only buy things at wholesale prices. And because we're buying at a discount and we're forcing the appreciation, we're able to create a pretty significant spread there where now we can refinance in 12, 18 months, let's say on average. And the lending environment doesn't change that much in 18 months on commercial real estate. If you take a look at the interest rate that I get, it's a lag of what's happening with like the daily interest rates. And so if the interest rate goes up by half a point in the next 12 months, my interest rate on my apartment building will probably only go up maybe 0.2 to 0.25% on my refi takeout when I go to refinance it. So that's a way that I can buy the building. I force the appreciation over the course of 12 to 18 months. I'm then able to refinance back out because essentially I'm all in for less than 65% of the stabilized value. Just like a lot of people buy a single family houses, they need to be all in at 65 cents of the after repair value. I need to be all in at 65% of the stabilized apartment value. Then I can go out and get a 75% loan to value loan on the refinance. I'm able to pay off my short-term bridge loan, my construction loan, I'm able to pay off my private equity investors and then it leaves a spread of uh, non-taxable refinance proceeds that I'm able to put in my pocket. And then it's only house money in play, right? Now it's non-recourse, long-term debt, long-term amortization, fixed interest rate, and it's a property that's cash flowing and regardless of what happens to the economy, I'm gonna be able to ride out any storm because it's stabilized it's fully renovated. I don't have any unknowns on maintenance. And we have good management in place, good tenants in place. And we don't have any investor capital in play any longer either. So it allows us to be able to sit on this thing for the next 10 years and ride out any storm. If you bought an apartment building in 2006 and it, we went through the Great Recession by 2016, that apartment building was worth a lot more than what you bought it for even in 2006 in the peak. And you were able to pay down a bunch of principal. So it gives you options the longer you can hold on to these things. And when you cast a wide networking net like you do, it really gives you the ability to find those value add deals in the first place, like you mentioned. Well, Tim, you're age 33 now. Looking back 10 years ago to when you started at age 23 with what you began to tell me about and how you bought that first home with a credit card, what would you do differently if you could talk to your 23-year-old self? I know you mentioned a lot of things, including mastermind groups in there. Anything you could have done to accelerate your success even more? And you've had a ton of success with a $150 million real estate portfolio already at age 33, but what could have made it even better? I think you hit the nail on the head. I would have joined a mastermind group earlier. Yeah. I didn't join a mastermind group until four years ago. I've been in real estate for 10 years. I was bad at it for the first six or seven years. It was only about four years ago that I got pretty good at it and uh, put me on this trajectory to be really have a lot of success. When I look back at that, it was this month, four years ago, that I went to my first mastermind event and they just stretched my thinking. And then I plugged in on a quarterly basis. And what that helped me do is as I reached each different hurdle or each different glass ceiling, I was able to punch through it that much quicker because every quarter I was meeting with these 
successful business owners and able to say, hey, here's my biggest struggle right now. What have you guys done? And there's so much brain power in the room. I said, hey, man, I went through that three years ago. Here's exactly what I did. That was awesome. Here's what I did that I wish I didn't do. Here's a couple of suggestions. And I was able to then fast track my success. It would take some people a lifetime or multiple lifetimes to build. I was able to do it in the past four years because I had that network and was able to plug into it. And sometimes you got to pay to play. Like that was a $30,000 a year mastermind group. And, but how I looked at it was not as a $30,000 expense. I looked at it as 2,500 bucks a month for a board of directors advising me on, on how to build my business, plugging into their network. People from that group introduced me to some of my first private money lenders who brought hundreds of thousands. And then like, there's one guy who I was introduced through that initial mastermind who has $3 million at any given time with me in private money. Like multiple people who would fit into that type of a category that just re- these relationships that you build and the insight that you gain is just remarkable by joining a mastermind. So I wish I would have done that earlier. But you know, other than that, I, I have no regrets. I, I think everything that I did it got me to where I am today and can't say I wish I did anything different. So if there's one thing that, could have been done sooner, it would have been joining a mastermind. Masterminds collapse timeframes like very few things can. Well, Tim, it's been great having you here. You've been really influential at a young age. What's the best place that people can learn more about you? Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm pretty active on social media. You see me on Facebook. I'm always trying to give value and give ideas and share deal flow and share deals that I've done and how they broke down and all that stuff on social media. So Facebook is a great place to connect with me. And then I think you had mentioned cleturnkey.com is my investment website and commercialempire.com is my coaching site. So appreciate it, Keith. You've given a ton of value and um, really making a big impact on people's lives. So thank you for everything that you do and all the influence that you provide as well. Tim, it's fun to watch you grow. Thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah, great stuff from Tim Bratz today. If you're looking him up, his last name is spelled B-R-A-T-Z. You know, I think that decades ago, two business owners, both of them in, say, the carpet cleaning business, they might have seen each other as competition, but the sharing economy has helped change that and really break that down. Now, Tim and I both grew through this era where competition is trumped by the power of collaboration. And yes, it is paradoxical. In a digital and virtual age, a lot of in-person mastermind groups thrive. That's because being on a computer all day makes some people crave the significance and camaraderie of a mastermind group. Airbnb is a sharing economy business where people utilize otherwise unused homes and apartments. Uber, again, it's that spirit of competition where people are using cars that wouldn't be used otherwise. Facebook, that's the digital sharing economy. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, they don't create their own content, just like Uber doesn't own any cars and Airbnb doesn't own any real estate and everyone shares or collaborates instead. Well, then a mastermind meetup of people in a like business is where people don't use homes or cars that they weren't previously given access to, like with Airbnb or Uber. Instead, they're using ideas that they weren't previously given access to. That's the share, the idea. Masterminds and social media have helped Tim grow big, fast, 1,900 plus units in 48 months as this sharing enables him to match money with real estate. Now, real estate is said to be about location, location, location. Well, I think something else can be said to be about location, 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 and that is geography. So in the next two weeks, renowned geopolitical expert Peter Zion returns to Get Rich Education. Yes, we'll have two weeks in a row of Peter. Next week's show will be named How the World Works, and the following week, it's how America works. And we're seeing those both through a real estate investing lens. Peter will be our guest for both shows. Those shows do indeed have some big ambitious titles. Come on, how the world works and how America works. But Peter is one of just a tiny, tiny group of people in the world that can possibly deliver on that. For some of the shows, you're going to be drawing this mental map in your head as you listen And I think geography is the most common thread woven throughout those next two weeks. We'll probably chat about the future direction of interest rates and inflation as well. 
but the geography of real estate is going to be the common theme. I'm absolutely going to love this every bit as much as you. You know that one of my degrees is in geography. Big thanks to the terrific Tim Bratz today. Besides his websites over on Facebook, look up Tim Bratz as well. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Until next week, do the right thing before you do things right and don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Countless investors get killed on their long-term maintenance costs in the rental property portfolio but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about my friends at JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build-to-rent model that allows clients like you to invest in new construction, turnkey rental property. That's why JWB has been featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and other national media. If you want new construction rental properties in your portfolio, talk to JWB. Give them a call at 904-677-6777 or visit them at newconstructionturnkey.com. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getricheducation.com.